Oh, thanks very much for the introduction, Pete. Um, really appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to speak to you this morning. Uh, when I first got approached by uh, Olivier, I thought, well, a lot of my work hasn't really been in team sports, so maybe I shouldn't be the right person to, to speak um, on the topic. Uh, but as I reflected, I thought maybe there are a few things that I've done over the years that, that might be beneficial and put it together in a bit of a, a retrospective. The picture there is from a, a study that uh, we've spoken about uh, tomorrow. Uh, um, we did a, a, a team sport football study in uh, in Bolivia, Santa Cruz and uh, La Paz, but um, come along and listen to five presentations tomorrow. I didn't want to steal other people's thunder, so I'm just doing a, a bit more of a retrospective. So I want to spend a little bit of time talking about my uh, own altitude uh, journey, then spend some time talking about performance. And if you're going to understand um, whether or not altitude is beneficial, we've got to understand uh, variation performance, a bit of magnitude statistics, um, a little bit of individual performance and a half a dozen studies that I think uh, might be relevant uh, that I've been involved with. And uh, getting back to the original question, I guess, uh, looking at a bit of uh, team, uh, team sport uh, performance and altitude. So my altitude journey, as Pete's correct, really did begin a good 20 years ago when I did 20 VO2 max tests in six months at a variety of locations around Australia and three of them were at uh, moderate altitude of, or low altitude of 600 metres and that started me on the path. But the guy pictured here is Charlie Walsh and he's Australia's, uh, was Australia's track cycling coach for uh, uh, six uh, Olympic Games and um, uh, he uh, presided over many um, gold medals. Uh, but really gave me my first opportunity to work with elite athletes and, and altitude. And that was in the lead up uh, to the uh, 1996 Olympic Games. And I'll speak about those data in a moment. And I just thought, I'd, if, if this video works, we'll see how it goes. Indulge um, uh, some of the Australians in the audience here. It's a bit of a low quality video, but it goes to the 84 Olympics when the uh, Charlie Walsh's guys took on the, uh, the Americans in the 4,000 metre pursuit. Australia versus the United States. They're the American team getting set and they have, co of course, have got the revolutionary bicycles, the aerodynamic shaped helmets, the latex covered skin suits, ultimate in uh, streamlining on the American boys and uh, the cap short of a medal. No matter what start. the outcome of this, the final of the team's pursuit. And there's the start. The Australians starting and finishing in the front straight. There's the Americans and they've already lost a rider. A sensation. One of the American riders has pulled his foot out of the... And we all know that Australia went on to win the gold medal uh, by about two seconds. But of course, you know, up against the American technology and also a bit of blood doping uh, has been subsequently revealed. Uh, it really was uh, one of the events. I was just finishing my uh, degree at this time, about to start a PhD, and it really got me um, inspired about Australian sports science. When it comes to uh, performance, the individual variation is what it's really all about. You're going to try and understand what's a, an important change and what altitude might do. And I chose a couple of uh, random examples there. Sally Pearson in gold, one of Australia's few gold medals from, um, from London in the 100 metres uh, hurdles and uh, one of the winter uh, Olympic cross country uh, events. And, you know, we all know if you're involved with elite sport, you know, races are won and lost uh, by, by centimetres. And uh, Will Hopkins, with some of his students, has done a bit of uh, modelling as to what the individual variation of race performance is, um, taking a whole lot of uh, race results from a range of Olympic Games and World Championships and modelling the whole thing out. And it comes out that the coefficient of variation uh, for race to, from race to race performance, not laboratory to laboratory, race to race performance is around about 1%, which equates to uh, 1 metre and 100 metres. So magnitude statistics. I started reading this guy, Jacob uh, Cohen's work, um, yeah, I guess back in the, in the mid-90s. Um, and he, he wrote some things that sort of took me a few years to get my head around, but as I progressed through, seemed to ring a, a bit truer. And this is from an article, the abstract uh, from the American psychologist in 1990. Um, he died in 98, so he's getting towards the end of his career. This is an account of what I've learned so far about the application of statistics to psychology and other biomedical sciences. I've learned to avoid the many misconceptions that surround Fisherian null hypothesis testing. I've also learned the importance of power analysis and the determination of how big rather than how statistically significant the effects is, uh, that we study. I emphasise again the determination of how big rather than statistically significant. And a few years later, he came up with a, uh, another article in the same journal. After four decades of severe criticism, 
and I guess it's now 2013, so I'd rephrase that, is after six decades of severe criticism, the ritual null hypothesis significance testing, mechanical dichotomous decisions around a sacred 0.05 still persists. And he goes on again, an emphasis on estimating effect sizes using confidence intervals as a, a way of making statistical inference. Quite a few years later, Will Hopkins uh, from uh, New Zealand there um, came up with, with the term smallest worthwhile change. And, and uh, it's not about statistical significance. It's about what's the smallest improvement to improve your chances of winning a medal or to improve your chances of getting ahead of the fourth place person or the, or the second place person. And again, a whole lot of bootstrap uh, uh, analysis. And he's come up with um, uh, the figure of 0.3%. And remember that an individual variation is about 1%, so a smallest worthwhile change of 0.3 is about a third of a metre. And, you know, one example, Sally Pearson, I'd say about a third of a metre ahead over 100 metres. And they're very, very small magnitudes. And if you um, are dealing with a, uh, a marathon, 0.3 would be 126 metres. They're not big distances, but having been fortunate enough to be involved with a number of coaches and their athletes for a number of years, they kind of have a gut feel uh, as to what are worthwhile changes uh, in performance uh, that make differences in terms of meddling or not. So then if I go back to the data that is the first study that I was fortunate to run with um, Charlie Walsh um, and Pete Borden and Neil Craig and reanalyse the data from eight um, world-class track cyclists, people of the calibre of uh, Brad Aitken, Stuart O'Grady, um, Luke Roberts. And we took them up to Toluca for 31 days and then got them to do some laboratory uh, performances, five-minute time trials before, three days post, eight days post and 20 days post. And using those um, relative to 0.3% of a smallest worthwhile change, the statistical ratios come out to be 79% likely that 1.4% improvement in performance is 79% beneficial, 10% trivial and 11% harmful. And plenty of coaches I know would be very happy with uh, day eight result, 1% likely um, beneficial with a 61% probability. Coaches will just want you to make a call 50-50. Is it going to work or is it not? 61%. Um, they don't want you to give them um, a, 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 a qualified answer. They want a yes or a no. So I'm just going to go and shoot my, those data in the foot um, with uh, a, a paper um, published online by Will Hopkins' first author, David Pine, um, looking at um, statistical power. And he says, and I think it is worth, um, sorry, labouring through it. You'll read it faster than I, but we're going to record it as well. No matter what the design, in my view, you need a minimum of 10 subjects to be confident about applying the effect to a, a similar group of uh, subjects. Sample size of 10 and a crossover will give you adequate precision if the effect is big enough or the dependent variable has an error of measurement smaller than the smallest worthwhile effect. Most of the time, though, effects are small or trivial. And the error of measurement is large, so you need many more than 10 subjects. And as we typically use in altitude studies, a parallel groups controlled trial, you need at least twice as many subjects in both groups. 20 subjects controlled, 20 subjects experimental. Um, in the La Paz study, we've got about those sort of numbers, but they're relatively few in the, uh, in the literature. And then he goes on to say a little bit further, um, these sample sizes are for magnitude-based inferences, that is, for adequate precision relative to the smallest important, smallest worthwhile change, to use the same terminology, either positive or negative. If instead uh, you stay with the traditional 80% power and 5% significance with the smallest effect, you will need another three times as many subjects, 60 experimental, 60 control. And um, for small effects, you're going to struggle. Get large effects, you can find it with five subjects, six subjects. With small effects, you're going to struggle with uh, our conventional sample sizes. That said, I want to look at some of the studies I've been involved with, which again do have relatively small power, but if the effects are big enough, we'll find something. Uh, a meta-analysis was published uh, in 2009 by Darrell Bonetti and his, and his supervisor, Will Hopkins, looking at performance changes following live high train low, and they uh, concluded a mean effect of 1.6% for all the studies. And when they compared that against the controlled studies, uh, it was a 4% performance effect, which to my understanding is way too big. And it's not because um, the performance was improved that much more by live high train low, it's because the control groups got 2.4% worse. 
Uh, and in this meta-analysis, it was the work of um, uh, professors Ben Levine, um, Jim Shrake Anderson, together with Rob Chapman, that their control group was quite influential in this, in this meta-analysis. Um, around the same uh, time, um, Philo Saunders, who will present later uh, for, from our group, put a little um, uh, paper in high altitude medicine biology, looked at a range of the studies uh, in terms of hours of hypoxic exposure and performance versus a control group. By doing a simple regression analysis, it's um, weighting each of those studies equally. Um, and we subdivide them into those, who, those studies which had more than, uh, sorry, less than 12 hours of hypoxic exposure per day and those that had uh, more than 12 hours. And for those in the literature, you'll recognise Alan Hahn, uh, Paul Robush, Julian Brugneau, Ben Levine, uh, Ari Namella um, with Haiti Rusko, Paul Robush again, Jim Stray Gunnison and John Verlin. And if you look at um, neg neglecting who the authors are, um, for a typical uh, 300 hours of exposure, three week, 12 hours per day kind of stuff, um, the relationship comes out to get about a 1.8%, 2% benefit of, of performance. T to me, uh, it's uh, you know small small changes. 1.8 uh, for typical event is probably you know the, the right kind of order. Um, but the interesting thing about this is that you know a thousand hours will give you 2.7% plus plus another one, so nearly 3.8%. Um, but um, uh, the interceptor 1.1 um, intrigues me because it says zero hours of hypoxia will give you 1.1% benefit, and I think that's probably consistent with the camp training effect. Um, if, if altitude is going to be uh, a worthwhile thing to pursue, it should give you reproducible um, improvements in performance. Uh, work from Eileen Robertson from uh, our laboratory published in uh, 210 um, is one of the very few studies uh, that's looked at reproducibility, uh, although Blake McLean um, from uh, um, Australian Catholic University will talk about another uh, live high, train high study uh, tomorrow. Sorry, wrong way. Back one. Sorry, I've out tricked myself here. Um, this study of Eileen's uh, did two blocks of hypoxia, um, 3,000 metres altitude uh, uh, for 14 hours a day, a washout for five weeks and then repeat it. And we used a, uh, a 4.5 kilometre time trial, an unusual distance, but there's a story behind that. For the first block of um, uh, live high, train low, we got uh, about a 1.1% faster than the control group, but the second time um, they actually got uh, slower, about 2% worse. The individual responsiveness, you can calculate that, actually put a number on it, and the magnitudes are around about 1.5% for both those blocks. So signal to noise, we're right in that area where um, it's getting very difficult to work out um, the magnitudes and the benefits. And if you look at the individual relationships of the change in the time trial as a percent, um, slower uh, versus faster for, um, versus block one versus block two, um, you get some, um, the, the slope's going the wrong way. You get people that were uh, slower the first time, are faster the second time, and, and the converse, that were faster the first time, and 2.5% uh, slower the second time. So yet to be convinced about the reproducibility of, uh, of altitude. Um, I then wanted to point out what I think are some of the limitations of a fair bit of uh, our own work and, and, and that of others, is that the vast majority of altitude studies have been laboratory-based. There's very few that have actually looked at performance after um, altitude in terms of racing. Uh, that's what it's all about, where you know uh, the results really count. Um, and this is a study from Philo Saunders um, from, from our lab. He had uh, quite a long, uh, many weeks of altitude exposure with a group of only seven subjects, but then looked at race performances in the Australian domestic precision, to season relative to the personal best performances. Published in IJSPP in uh, 2009, I think the mean magnitude of effect was about, about 1.6% improvement in performance. No control group, uh, but uh, real world racing. Philo also published uh, another study in IJSPP in 2010 uh, where we attempted to quali quantify placebo effects. And uh, buried deeply in that paper, it talks about that four of the only small six subjects that we had uh, re uh, walked 20 kilometre PBs. And uh, one of the guys went out and uh, produced two Olympic uh, medals uh, from the, the study group. Um, Claire Goff uh, just uh, graduated a PhD um, a few few months ago. Did another of, the, of I think of the, the better racing studies that are that are out there this time uh, with swimmers. Good on you, Will. Where did he come from? <laughs> his, his ears must be burning. 
this uh, study of Claire's looked at three different, oh, three different groups. A classic altitude group that went and uh, trained up the mountain around uh, two, 2,000 metres, uh, Sierra Nevada and another group in Flagstaff. Um, a live high train load group back in Canberra and a race control group. And we looked over a three week um, uh, bout of, uh, of altitude, the changes in swimming performance uh, serially thereafter. And uh, where positive times are slower and negative times are faster or negative changes, um, we got a clear um, slower a slowing of performance, 0 0.1 to half to half a percent slower immediately post altitude, and that there was really no clear benefit of altitude training, either the natural or the live high train low group. And again, we can quantify individual responsiveness, and again, we've got this magnitude of about one percent. Is that the signal to noise are about equal to each other. Another uh, cool thing I think that Claire did was went and got uh, all the natural altitude uh, people um, and pair matched them with the international point score for swimming. Um, with a group over um, uh, that did no altitude training and looked at their national championship uh, swim times and then their performances at the world championships relative to the block of altitude, which was uh, about five weeks earlier. And um, you get a, about a 1% improvement in performance in both groups, individual responsiveness again around about 1% and no net benefit of altitude being the, uh, the, the conclusion. Again, re reasonable sample sizes in that study with 14 and 21 compared to a small's worthwhile change. Um, so finally getting on to, uh, I guess, the topic of, of the whole symposium, the, uh, the benefits of altitude training for uh, team performance. And to me, and it's already been mentioned, you know, football, Dave um, Bishop put a very nice video to, um, to, to show you all, is a, is a sport of great skill, of decision making under pressure, of reading the play, of tactics, of penalty shootouts and even referee decisions that can determine the outcome of, of games. So under those sort of circumstances, I think it's going to be pretty hard to show performance benefits um, from uh, altitude interventions. Australian football, um, uh, I've got a few, of, uh, few people from different clubs here, I know. Um, the reason I put this slide together is that uh, the premierships uh, in Australia have been won by, uh, for the last uh, six years, five of the wins have been by teams that did not use altitude training, did not use altitude training, which, you know, looking at magnitude's effect and how many other factors are going in to making a performance in a, in a, in a team sport is not too surprising. And so I haven't had the, the time to present lots of the, the, the physiological evidence. Other people will, will do so. I think there are good mechanisms of, of altitude which will change some of the underlying physiology. And, you know, when it comes to the coaches, I would say possibly race performance. It's not just about the group mean uh, response, it's about the individual. The coach of uh, Alicia Coots, uh, for instance, one of Australia's uh, best me uh, medalists, five medals in, in London, he doesn't want to know does altitude work for the group, he wants to know does altitude work for Alicia. And so we've worked a lot with various individuals trying to, to tune altitude uh, for them and their performances. So in terms of a weight of evidence, in terms of T-sport performance, I think uh, there is going to be uh, a quite, quite a challenge to show that, that uh, um, altitude is going to affect the outcome of, in terms of goals of, uh, of football games. Thanks very much for your, uh, your time and attention.